Welcome you. Come forward. Come and minister to us. I got to meet Ruth just, a, was it last month or two months ago when I came up to Glasgow and to see the gift upon her life. Would you open your hearts to her as she brings a word in season into our lives and it's going to land and it's going to take life in you. Lord, I thank you for what you placed in Ruth and we receive you in Jesus' name. I bless you. Amen. Amazing. Praise God. Wow. Well, hello. Good evening. Hi. My name is Ruth, and uh, as Anna shared there, I've come down from Glasgow. Um, I work with David and Emma Stark, who I believe you guys know. Yeah. Is that correct? Emma speaks very affectionately of this group. She, she thinks very highly of you, and when she uh, told Hannah and I about the opportunity to come down, she was just like, you guys are going to have the best time when you see what God's doing down there. So firstly, I thank you for receiving me. This is a treat for me, honestly. And Trevor and Sharon, I've heard of you. As I just said when I met you, I've heard of you from afar. And um, it's a real honor and a real blessing to get to be here and step into the space that you have built and so uh, faithfully stewarded for years. And I was just saying to them when I, when I was chatting to them before, uh, what I've heard of you is that you have stewarded revival well. You stewarded revival well, and you've remained faithful to the call. Yeah. And I've only been in ministry for, I don't know, 20-ish years. So not many generations or anything like that. But what I do know is that there's not many who have really stayed with it and stayed on course and who have stood the test of trials and endured. And I don't know your story, but if I had three hours with you, I would be so keen to hear what have you seen the Lord overcome on your behalf? How have you endured? How have you continued to steward what he is doing here? And one day, maybe I'll pick your brain for all those stories. Uh, but the fact that God is clearly here and God is clearly moving, I think is testament to what you have built and what you have carried here. So thank you for having me. So, yeah. And Anna, so excited uh, to meet you and Ryan as well. Where's Ryan? He was on the stage, wasn't he? Ryan and band, thank you. Thank you for that. What a treat. As we were worshipping, I saw um, a number of things, but actually um, angels with trumpets kind of like flying around here. And I just heard them saying, the king of glory is coming. The king of glory is coming. The king of glory is coming. And I just heard that being declared in the space. And I really believe you guys as the band opened that up. And Jesus is here, right? Like Jesus is here, but there is more. There is more. So thank you, band, for opening that up. And I'm, I'm really excited about this week and even getting to be at church on Sunday. And are you Jared that spoke last night? I heard you opened up things for revival. So that's great. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from you as well. That's going to be good. Anyway, it is a treat to be here. I was confessing to the guys earlier that I actually don't know England very well. And I'm kind of embarrassed to say that because I really like England. I'm from Scotland. I grew up in Edinburgh. I live in Glasgow now. Um, but my cousins, who I'm very close to, all live in England. And so I have fond memories of uh, visiting them in, uh, in Blackpool and Cambridge kind of area. Um, you know, or them all coming up and they all have these lovely English accents. Uh, so though I don't know this nation as well as I wish I did, I'll tell you, when I hear people like you guys talking, I feel like you're my cousins. <laughs> Like, I feel this kind of family fondness. So if you've heard any nonsense about Scottish people being hostile towards the English, I tell you, firstly, I am sorry that some people have spoken like that, and will you forgive my nation? And secondly, I love you guys to bits. Thanks for having me. So it's fun to be here. Interestingly, this week, God brought me to this area. And uh, yeah, so there's three different reasons that I'm here. On Wednesday just there, I was in Wolverhampton. Is that how you say it? Hands up if you're from Wolverhampton. Am I saying it right? Or how do you say it? Wolverhampton. Wolver how do you say it? Wolverhampton. It's, I've never been there. But I was there on Wednesday for a meeting, actually about a big um, Great Commission fest, uh, stadium gathering called The Send. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, but I was in a meeting in Wolverhampton about that. And then we've got our dear friend Sam Robertson is getting married not far from here on Monday. So we're going to that wedding. And so then when the opportunity was opened up to be here with you guys here at this conference, I just looked at where it was on the map and I'm like, man, what is God doing in that area? That's three things in one week. And so though, yes, I have come to share the word of the Lord with you and I've got a word for you that he has spoken very clearly. Also, I'm kind of here because I believe that God wants to show me something here of what he is doing 
because there's something that I need to learn and I need to carry back to Scotland. So thank you for letting me dive in. And even in worship there, I was asking the Lord, what is it, what is it? And, and I heard him saying that this area in England, if the, if the nation was a band, this area is the base. This area is the bass guitar. There is a deep sound that comes from here and it, it reverbs through the nation and, and it buzzes and it shifts things. You know what it's like when you stand next to a speaker and you just hear that bass and it, it makes a physical movement. You know, if you've got anything sitting on top of the speaker, it kind of tremors. You know what I mean? Well, there is a sound that comes from this part of the nation and it it changes things, it moves things, and, and it is felt across the nation. And I actually saw in the spirit this bass line, this bass sound going out. And as it buzzed, it was like this, uh, this basin was kind of carved in the land. And I noticed in the spirit that this area, you, you can go deep here in the spirit. There's this kind of motion like that. Does anyone feel that here? Or are you just so used to it because you live in it? I'll tell you, it's not like that in Scotland. <laughs> there's other good things in Scotland for sure. But there's a depth here that I believe is accessible uh, because of what you have stewarded for years and because of your partnership with the Lord. And I heard the Lord saying, my people here work with me. My people here don't work for themselves. My people here, they hear my voice and they respond to me. And because they have worked with me for years, they have carved out a depth in the spirit. And I believe that it is like, do you know that story where there's the waters and the angel would stir the waters and people would dip in and get healed? I believe that happens here. Am I right? Yeah. yeah does that happen here? Yeah. I believe that the depth in the spirit in this area right here, uh, it's like, there's almost like a kingdom of God magnet that pulls in the broken and the crushed and those in need of healing because the depth here is it's like healing waters and I hear the Lord saying that this is the place where I bring beauty from ashes this is the place where I take what is broken and what is dirty and what is ugly and I make it beautiful and I make it clean. And so I hear the Lord saying, do not be surprised when I bring the most broken. Do not be surprised when it seems that there is chaos and there is confusion and there are troubled souls because I have brought those people here because I believe that here they will find their hope. Here they will be restored. Here they will be made new. So praise God for that. I am just, I am watching, I am learning. I am blessed to be here, so thanks for having me. Anyway, what am I going to talk to you about tonight? A number of things. Let me pull up my notes here. Um, oh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I, was, I got distracted talking about you because I like you guys already. Um, so I'm Ruth. I'm from Global Prophetic Alliance. I lead intercession there, which I love. Um, I, I have a husband and two young kids. They are eight and ten, and they are absolutely great. Um, I was saved um, as, a, as a teenager, actually, though I grew up in a Christian family. I didn't really know Jesus personally um, until I was 17, following a very radical encounter in which, as a 16-year-old, I literally met Jesus in a dream. Like, I stood before him face-to-face -face in the desert, and I had a conversation back and forth with him where he spoke to me. And at the time, I didn't know he was God. I just thought that was a random dream. But that encounter set me on a path that led me to meet him in a real way. And I finally gave my life to him when I was 17 and I haven't turned back. And do you know what? I felt I needed to share that piece tonight because I believe there's people in the room who are laboring in the spirit over unsaved or backslidden children and grandchildren. I don't know if there's anyone in here like that, but I just sense the Lord was saying that there are some people who are despairing over the yet unanswered prayers of, of these young people meeting Jesus in a real and radical way. And I just want to say that I have faith for those people because I was those people. That was my story growing up. And so if that is you, in the name of Jesus, I bless those you love. I bless those that you are laboring for to find salvation, to find revelation of the one true God. And I say, Jesus, you are the king of glory. May you come into their lives. And Lord, we pray for a great breakthrough even from this day forth. Lord, that these young ones, whether they are unsaved or backslidden, Lord, that they would come to you and they would come to you without delay in Jesus' name. So feel seen. God sees you if that's your family member or a friend or someone like that. Um, he put that on my heart today to share. Um, but what, what have I done since I became a Christian? Um, I spent a few years in missionary training, actually, um, in Hawaii and Southeast Asia. 
not a bad place to be trained as a missionary. I met my husband there. He's actually American. Uh, he's from Southern California, though you wouldn't believe it because he's got ginger hair and pale skin. And most people think that he's the Scottish one and I'm the American one. Um, but no, we met in Hawaii. We moved back to Scotland uh, where we studied and we've been in ministry ever since then. Uh, before I worked at Global Prophetic Alliance, I worked for a church and I led a church and I planted a church and I got to labor over the joys of local church. Who's involved in local church here? Yes, what a joy, what a joy. Um, so that was my story. Um, but it's funny because I wasn't really a traditional pastor. Um, I, I think of traditional pastors as the people who really love people well and they care for the flock. And, and I have capacity to do that, like, like, a, like a good amount, but, but not a load amount. I would describe myself probably more as like the the prophet leader who's like, this is where God's going. We need to go there. Who's coming to? If you're not coming, then maybe this isn't the church for you. <laughs> and so some people loved being in my church. Some people didn't. Um, but I tell you that because what I'm going to do tonight is two things. One, there are a few very clear words that I feel the Lord wants me to share with you. So you're going to see the prophet side of me coming out. And I'm sorry if it sounds blunt and bold at times, and I'm sorry if it's surrounding some quite sensitive issues, but I encourage you to take these words and test them. Test them with the Spirit of God. Test them against the truth. Test them against Scripture. But you're also going to see me tonight sidestepping from prophetic words into teaching. And I really want to unpack some of these concepts from the Bible. Because I believe that these words will land and be walked out and understood in fullness when we really understand the truth. Because Jesus says, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Yeah. Right? And that's what we're doing. We're not just talking about prophetic words for prophetic words' sake. We're, say, we're saying we want to walk into liberation. Yeah. We want to see the king of glory come in. And we want to walk into the fullness of freedom ourselves, but also lead our, the people here into freedom, right? So you'll want to have your Bibles ready um, or your phones if you've got wee apps. If you're the kind of person who likes to take notes, there's going to be like loads of scripture references uh, tonight. So <laughs> sorry if there's a lot, but you can take notes and you can, you can look them up in your own time and... That'll be fun. So let's get started. Will you turn with me to Matthew 24, 6? Here we go. And what, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is this. Two things. One, do not be alarmed. Two, Stand firm. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, do not be alarmed. Great. Turn to your other neighbor and say, stand firm. Brilliant. We are good to go. I believe that when there are troubling and difficult times ahead, God likes to anchor our hope uh, in the future in what he has said he will do or in who he is. And we see that in, uh, you know, in the Bible, things like uh, Joseph being, being told in advance that there's famine coming so that they could get ready, so that they could make preparations. And uh, actually, uh, this year, just for me, this is, I mean, this is not as extreme as a, a global famine, um, but the Lord told me earlier in the year, uh, this year I'm going to give you a new car and a new house for a new season. And I thought, oh, Lord, that's the word I love to hear. What I didn't know was that the next week my car was going to break and be completely unfixable and we didn't have the money to get a new one. But I knew the Lord had said he was going to give me a new car for a new season. And he did. And there's a story behind that. I'll share another time. Um, and then I was like, oh, well, he said he was giving us a new house too. But I quite like my flat. Like, I oh, wonder why God's giving us a new house. And then we found out our mortgage was up for renewal. And when we found out how much our mortgage was going to be going up by, we realized we can't afford to stay in the home that we have loved for the last 10 years and raised our kids in. Like, we just have to go because we can't afford it. But I knew that in this story, I was not the victim of a cost of living crisis or rising interest rates, right? No, God had already said, I'm giving you a new house for a new season. So I've hung on to that. And just last week, we had an offer accepted on an incredible new house. Praise God. So do not be alarmed. Sometimes God tells us that difficult things are coming, but he also offers us his perspective of what he is doing so we can be encouraged and we can stand firm with him. Matthew 24 says this. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah. This is verse five. And they will deceive many. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed. 
because these things must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will hand you over for persecution and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will take offense, betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply and the love of God will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be delivered. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Praise God. Um, some of you will have had uh, different versions there. Some say endure to the end. Some say stand firm. Uh, but what I heard God saying that he wants us to talk about tonight is how do you stand firm in days of war, famine, and plague? Those are the three words. Is anyone else in this room rightfully disturbed when you hear about what's going on in the news? Yeah, abroad and at home. Yeah, I am rightfully disturbed. Sometimes actually reading the news is just a bit too much. The level of destruction and pain and suffering and alarming things going on. And I think that it's natural and it is human to be disturbed by shocking things. That is okay. And yet we have a Lord who says, in this world, you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. Yeah. So how do we be people who put on that overcomer mindset with Jesus, who says that he has already overcome it? And I would say, to be able to walk in confidence in what God is doing in days such as this, we need to know, who is this God? What is he like? What does he like? What is he all about? Because when we know him, we can put our trust in him and we can rest assured in that. Yeah. But when we don't really know who he is and what he thinks about these things, it can be very unsettling. And I say this not to, not to insult any of your relationship with God, but I do say for any time that you wobble in your confidence, there is an opportunity to know God better. Every bit of anxiety, every bit of, of fear is an invitation to say, huh, what am I not understanding about God in this situation? Because I see that fear has just leaked in here. Yeah. And so if you hear anything from me tonight, I want you to spark a curiosity to get to know God better. Search who he is and learn about him. And I would actually say uh, the best way to get to know God, aside from you know spending time with them, worship, praise, prayer, talking about up to other people who know him, is just read the Bible a bunch. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to understand the biblical languages to learn who God is in this book. It's translated pretty well. Yeah. You don't need to be an expert. And do you know what? I'm in a discipline where I read through the whole Bible every year. Sometimes I don't read it all because sometimes I'm a bit slow. But I aim for the whole Bible every single year. And what I do is I don't do a deep dive in every single bit I read. But the, one, or the questions I'm asking as I read through the Bible is I'm saying, God, what are you like? Because this culture is different than my culture and these customs are different than what I live in. But you're the one that's the same in these stories as now. And so I'm just watching over and over, like how does God interact with his people? What does he do when they do things? How does he respond? What's he gonna do next? What does he say back to them? Because in observing these stories, no matter what time or context, I can learn who he is and what he is like. The other interesting thing about reading the whole Bible cover to cover is it forces you to read the bits of the Bible that you usually like to skip. Has anyone got any bits of the Bible they like to skip? Anyone want to shout them out? Just confess. Bits you like to skip in the Bible? Anyone? Bits of numbers. Bits of numbers. Anything else? Bits of Leviticus. Anything else? What was that? Oh, bits of Ezekiel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fair. We all have bits we like to skip. This is a disturbing book. Um, I'm going to go to Leviticus because this is a bit that I like to skip, but I read it uh, at some point in the last couple of years and it rocked my world. So turn with me if you want to, to Leviticus 26. And I'm not going to read you the whole passage because there's a lot there. You can read it yourself. But picking out a couple bits, Listen to what our God says to his people, the Israelites, back then, thinking this is the same God now. 
He says from 26.3, if you follow my statutes and faithfully observe my commands, I will give you rain at the right time and the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until sowing time. You will have plenty of food to eat and live securely in your land. I will give you peace in the land so that you will lie down and nothing will frighten you. And he continues to talk about all the great things that he will bless the land with if they continue to be faithful to him. And then skip over to verse 14. But if you do not obey me and observe all these commands, if you reject my statutes and despise my ordinances and do not observe all of my commands and break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring terror on you, wasting disease and fever that will cause your eyes to fail and your life to ebb away. You will sow your seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will turn against you so that you'll be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee even though no one is pursuing you. And it goes on and you can read that in your own time. Uh, but let's skip to verse 40. But if they will confess their sin and the sins of their fathers, their unfaithfulness that they practiced against me and how they acted with hostility toward me. And I acted with hostility towards them and brought them into the land of their enemies. And if their uncircumcised hearts will be humbled and if they will pay the penalty for their sin, then I will remember my covenant, Jacob. And it goes on and God talks about how he is faithful, he is gracious and merciful when people humble themselves and come back to him. Now, I read this recently, and honestly, I was disturbed because I want to say, my God wouldn't talk like this. There's something in my wee heart that wants to say, oh, but God wouldn't inflict bad consequences. Anyone else feel like that a little bit? Yeah, well, not just me then. Okay, well, I was challenged by that. But I have to see in this that our God is a God with righteous and justice standards. Like, that's something about who he is that I maybe wasn't raised to really think about. And while I celebrate that Jesus has paid it all and Jesus' blood is enough and that covers our sins and we are saved in him by grace through faith and I have no doubt about that. I celebrate that. But yet I see in the character of God that he has set up the world in such a way that he actually wants us to choose righteousness and to walk with him. And so he says, if you do it my way, there's blessings that comes with that. Because he's a good father. And what father doesn't reward his people, you know, motivate them to keep going. But he also says, but if you don't, there's consequences. And then he says, but you don't have to live with the consequences. Because if you confess your sin and you humble yourself and you come back, I will remember my promises to you. And you know what? That's a theme that is not just in Leviticus, but continues on throughout the, the, the whole Bible. Old and New Testament. And that, honestly, has been a bit of a challenge to me. But since God spoke that to me a couple of years ago, I've started to notice a lot of the suffering, shocking, hard things going on in the world. And I've started to realize, wait a second, these things could be an alarm waking us up and inviting us to humble ourselves before God and get back into alignment with him. And he says that when you come back, you know, he, he is so quick to show mercy and forgiveness and to restore. But sometimes he just wants to shock us enough to invite us back. So that is a thought. Let's talk about war, famine, and plague, because those are the three things I see described in Leviticus, and those are three things I see in the world right now. Now, <clears throat> so starting with war, um, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, six weeks ago, I was preparing for a teaching, um, actually with our GPA network, and I think it was maybe a teaching on fasting or something like that, and I was, as I was preparing, I heard the Lord saying, teach them how to pray in days of war. I thought, huh, wow, and then I heard the Lord say this, he asked me a question, he said, if rockets launched into your city tomorrow, would you know how to gather your community to fast and pray? I thought, oh, that's a good, that's a good challenge because 
don't really expect rockets to launch into my city tomorrow, but I thought, yeah, would we be ready if sudden crisis hit? And so then I talked that night and discussed that with, you know, whoever was on that call. And I thought, that's a good challenge. And, and as I thought about how do you how do you respond in crisis? I thought, okay, well, you know, do we know how to fast? Do we know what fasting is? Do we have open communication lines where we can talk to each other about prayer strategy? Are we in the rhythm of this? Or, or actually, is prayer so foreign in our community that we don't even know how to run into it? And so I felt that challenge from God, like, okay, let's get ready, let's get ready, so that when crisis hits, we know what to do. The next day, Saturday, the no, 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 Friday, the 6th of October, a man named Lauren Cunningham passed away. Now, who knows who Lauren Cunningham is in the room? Yes. Um, Lauren Cunningham was the founder of Youth with a Mission, YWAM. An incredible man. In the 60s, he made it possible, in response to a vision from God and a call from God, for young people to fulfill the Great Commission by going overseas as missionaries. And in those days, uh, there was all sorts of obstacles to just normal people going into missions. You had to have a Bible college degree, you had to do all sorts of things. And he carved a path in which everyday normal people and even young people could be a part of fulfilling the Great Commission by going out to the ends of the earth and reaching unreached people. And this guy, Lauren Cunningham, he devoted his life to this task. And he stayed faithful to the end. And he was incredible. So the day after, um, I heard from the Lord on, would you know how to you know, pray in times of war. Lauren Cunningham passed away. And I was kind of, you know, I was really moved by that. And I heard the Lord saying to me as I was processing it, Lauren Cunningham was faithful to what I asked him to do. And because of him, the Great Commission is now available to so many people that it wouldn't have been otherwise. And as a result, there are channels forged to unreached people groups that couldn't have been there otherwise. He was faithful and he completed the task that I gave him. And I am pleased with that. And then I heard the Lord saying, we are now at a tipping point when it comes to global awakening and global revival. And what I saw in the spirit was this picture of like a ship that has already put out its, its nets, its fishing nets, and pulled up this catch. And it was like the nets were so full of fish that it was almost tipping the boat. And I heard the Lord saying, this is the moment we are at. We are on edge of what is potentially an awakening like we haven't seen before on a global scale. So that was the Friday. Saturday, the 7th of October, I woke up to the news. 2,000 rockets have been launched into Israel. And the headline said, Israel says, we are at war. And instantly, these things from the last two days came together. And I understood this. One, God is calling us to know how to pray in times of war. And there is strategy behind that. And two, there is a direct link between the seriousness of war and yet also the opportunity for harvest. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. There is a direct link between the seriousness of war and the opportunity for harvest. And that is the moment that we are in. Yeah. So how do you pray in times of war? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say two things. First, I don't want to make it about right and wrong. Just pray, just pray in times of war. But two things that God spoke to me. One, know how to fast. And I already mentioned that. If you're not already in a lifestyle of prayer and fasting, I'd say start reading about it. Start chatting to people who do it. Not everyone's physical bodies are able to completely fast from food all the time, but all of us can be in a lifestyle where we pray and where we fast. And I believe actually that in these days, there's where previously there have been intercessor types who did the intercession for the group. Uh, now I believe that everyone is called and, and being called up into being the intercessor types who fast and pray. This is a call for everyday believers everywhere. So if you've not looked into that already, get on board. But number two, decree. And I heard the Lord saying to me, there is a difference between prayers of petition and prayers of decree. Both are powerful. Both are powerful and both have their place. So this is not a right and wrong. But let me tell you what I mean by this. So prayers of petition are the ones where we as children of God go to our Father and we talk to him about what is on our hearts. 
We say, Lord, this is what's on my heart and this is what I want to see you do. And so maybe it's personal stuff in your life, but it could also be bigger picture stuff like war. Lord, I'm so devastated about the suffering I'm reading about on the news. Would you help those people? Would you send aid? Would you shift something? Would you push back the enemy? You know, you can pray prayers of petition like that. And those are prayers that originate in your heart and they're going up to your father in heaven and he hears and he is stirred by the petitions that we raise up. And we know that these are powerful because, you know, Jesus talks about the persistent widow and he says, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking. Prayers of petition are good, but they start from us and they go to God. What I want to highlight today is a different direction of prayer. And this is decrees. So decrees are where we start with Jesus, who is our king. And we say, Jesus, you rule and you reign on the earth. And you have called me as your royal priesthood to rule with you. So, Jesus, what are you saying over the earth that you want me to command with my spoken word in prayer, believing that that will shift atmospheres. So prayers of decree start with the king where you hear what Jesus is saying about a thing and then we as his people get to do the work in speaking it out verbally in prayer and that is powerful. That is powerful and I believe that in days of war we need to get good at decreeing. Hands up if you're already in a, um, I don't know, like in the habit of praying, praying in decrees. Anyone? Yeah, quite a few of you. Great. So you know what that's about. This is powerful stuff. So for example, how do we pray in times of war? Instead of saying, Lord, it is on my heart that, that you would shift in these wars and that you would move and you would reveal yourself to people. It's saying, Jesus, what do you want to do? And so in this case, I hear the Lord saying, I want people to return to righteousness. I want... I want my justice to be extended on the earth towards all evil. And I want them to encounter the truth and I want salvation. And I hear the Lord saying that. And so I decree things like this. In the name of Jesus, I decree a return to righteousness for all involved. And I go really specific. And in the name of Jesus, I decree that the justice of God will extend on the earth. And Lord, that you will have the last say because you are true and you are good. And I decree that they will know the truth that they will find salvation, that Jesus, you will be revealed as king. See how that's a different posture of prayer, yeah? This is how we are called to pray in times of war. And it's exciting. I've heard some great stories from some people who uh, have been praying with decrees and even like in their communities. You can do this bigger picture. You can do this in your life. I spoke to a high school teacher who told me that he was really disturbed by the level of violence in the school, actually since coming out of COVID. Um, has anyone encountered that in schools in this area? Like increased fights, increased, yeah, violence, unsettledness in the kids' mental health issues. I, I certainly a lot of my teacher friends in Glasgow have described that. But I spoke to a teacher who told me that in the past, the school fights happened at the school gates at the end of the day. But since COVID and, you know, family breakdowns, mental health crisis, um, children, you know, the fights were happening in the classroom. Children were coming to school with weapons. Like, it was really quite unsafe and quite dangerous. And so this guy, and I really respect him, he, he was started taking decrees seriously. He was like, I'm, I'm working with the king here, so I'm going to take the command of the king and I'm going to command that over my classroom. And so he sought Jesus for what Jesus wanted to command and decree over his space and he wrote some decrees and there were things along the lines of I decree this is a safe space I decree an end to violence I decree peace you know and, and he just started decreeing over his classroom and he noticed the fight stopped but then he heard the fights are still going on it's just in other parts of the school so he started prayer walking the corridors of the school and going around the school and again doing the same I decree peace in this space I decree, decree an end to violence and, and all of that right enough the fight stopped in the school but they were still happening outside the school gates. And that's when he realized, huh, I need to start decreeing this into the communities. And then he sought God for what are you doing in their families and in their homes? Because really that's where this originates from. And so what started with a problem in front of his face where he just couldn't, couldn't get his class environment to be safe turned into a very deep prayer strategy for the transformation of families in the community. And when he told me this, he was like, I can't yet verify whether my decrees are changing families because that's all happening behind closed doors, but I'm praying that one day I will see the fruit of that. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So ask the Lord, how do you want me to decree over where I am, yeah. over my city, and over the nations? Yeah. 
Because you can do that when you come up with Jesus. So that's how to pray in times of war. I know Hannah is going to be talking more about how we stand firm in war tomorrow. But I'm going to move on to another one here. Famine. How do we stand firm in a famine? Do you know what the biggest causes on the earth are of famine? Anyone, any guesses? Oh, I can't hear you guys. Shout it out. Yeah, yeah, like poverty. Oh, war, war. Drought, yeah. Yeah, so according to Google, which is probably accurate, it's conflict and climate are the two main causes. So war and uh, issues surrounding the climate, although obviously poverty is high up there as well, uh, but primarily conflict and climate. So we've talked about war. Now, to talk about famine, uh, let's mention climate. Climate is a hot topic right now, isn't it? Climate can be quite divisive <laughs> amongst communities and even within the church. And I know that climate is one of the biggest issues that the younger generation are really anxious about. Climate is one of these breaking points for them that, you know, they, they are angry at the older generations that haven't looked out after the earth well enough and they, and they believe that they'll have to reap the consequences of that. And there's a lot of young people in this, this generation they call Gen Z or Gen Z who can't believe in a good and loving God because they're so disturbed by the climate issue. So I tell you, God has got a lot to say on climate. God is also disturbed by climate issues. In fact, sometimes God is the climate issue. So we as Christians, I think, if we need, or if we want to be a part of partnering with what God is doing in times of crisis and famine, and if we want to have vocabulary to engage particularly with the younger generation, we need to know what does God say when there's climate disasters? How does God respond to that? And how does he ask us to respond? So I want to talk about that a little bit. And I don't want to go political. I'm not going to go into um, the practical side of what we should or shouldn't be doing. I can also confess that I am not a climate scientist. I will not even try to be one. I know some. I know some spirit-filled, biblically-based climate scientists. And I love hearing what they say about things. But that is not my area. My area is uh, obsessively reading the Bible because I love God and hearing the word of the Lord for today. So I will try and talk about the climate crisis from that perspective. You can verify facts somewhere else with more um, skilled people than I am. Um, whether or not you believe that uh, we are the primary problem behind the changes in climate we are seeing in these days, I think we can all agree that in these days we are seeing an increase in storms, uh, yeah, heating up of temperature, extreme winters, extreme summers, like we are seeing changes, right? My 10-year-old son says, oh, my life will be so interesting to tell my children about because in my life, lots of things happened. I'm like, all right, what kind of things happened in your life? He's like, well, you know, there was COVID and we all went into lockdown. I'm like, yeah, that, that, that was a big one. He's like, and I was there when the climate changed. I'm like... <laughs> Right? Because that was just one event in your life where the climate changed. <laughs> Love how 10-year-olds don't have the, the years of perspective, but it's true. He was there when the climate changed. The climate is changing, whatever the reason for that. And so I tell you this, whether it is earthquake that comes from beneath or whether it is storms or drought that comes from the weather patterns around, when natural disasters happen, this is what we do. We inquire of God, okay? So what do we do? We inquire of God. We ask him, what is going on and what am I meant to understand from this? Because climate issues are actually meant to be wake-up calls. In the Bible, when you read this over and over, you will see there are so many stories in the Bible that could have been titled God and the Climate Crisis. There are so many. And actually, I think that understanding what God is saying through unusual natural disasters is something that we as modern day Western believers have not really tapped into in the fullness that we could. Because I think there's a lot to understand about what God is saying on the earth and on these days that we are ignoring because all we think is, uh, oh, that was really shocking. How, that, that's so awful that that happened. And so when uh, these disasters happen, my questions are this. One, 
God, did you do that? Is this an act of God? Or two, was this a curse as a result of sin? In which case, can we do business in the spirit to reverse this and see you heal the land? Or three, was there something else that I didn't understand about that? But Lord, what are you seeing and what do you then want us to do in response? And do you know what? I love that I think that there's a really good and healthy response to natural disasters when it comes to us being people who bring relief and bring care and bring resources. And that is a very important part of how God wants us to respond to disasters. So I honor that and I bless that. And I'm really, uh, really thankful for, for the quick responses in relief and caring for others. That is one thing. But I think that we often only focus on how can we bring relief after disasters rather than saying, Lord, how can we understand what is going on on the earth and how can we see you restore it? And so this is what I hear the Lord saying through most climate disasters. I hear him saying this, come back to me. Come back to me and I will heal the land. Back to Leviticus 26, I'm not going to read it again, but you will notice that in the list of blessings for obedience, he talks about giving rain in its season and crops growing and being plentiful. Like He lists a number of things that imply the climate works and it goes well when you follow me. And yet also when he lists the, um, the consequences of disobedience, he then lists things like, you know, drought and yeah. famine and actually things where the climate's not operating properly. Surely we all know Second Chronicles 7.14. Do we know it by heart? If my people, say it with me, who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. Yeah, we all know that one, right? And how often do we pray that one simply just about salvation and revival? Most of the time, yeah? And it's good. And it is, I think it is definitely about that. But what are the verses that precede that? Do you, let's read that. Let me just look that up. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Uh, so from 12-ish. I have heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. If I close the sky, that's God talking. If I close the sky so there's no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, that's God talking, or if I send pestilence on my people and my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. If we are only praying this scripture referring to the awakening of, of, of hearts and, and people coming back to God, we're missing out on the fullness of what this is really about. Because yeah. actually... This one is not just about people coming back to God and being restored and being uh, revived. This is actually about him changing what is going on in the climate and changing the fruitfulness of the land to produce and to sustain life. Do you see that? And this truth, it still applies now. Like it still applies now. Did you know that God actually says he uses nature to do his bidding? You know that? Psalm 148, 7 to 8. I'm just firing the scriptures at you. Let's look that up. Psalm 148, 7 to 8 says this. Praise the Lord from the earth, all sea monsters and ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and cloud, powerful wind that executes his command. So my translation says executes his command. Some versions say stormy winds that do his bidding. God is saying, sometimes I use extreme weather to accomplish my purposes. Sometimes it was me that did that. Have you noticed in the, the classic Joseph and, and Pharaoh and the cows and the, you know, the famine story, have you noticed in that one what Joseph says when he's explaining it to Pharaoh about who's causing the famine? Have you noticed that? Let me look it up. Genesis 41, is it? Can find it. Obviously, not got it underlined in this Bible. <laughs> when he interprets the dream, I can't. Maybe one of you guys will find it before me. He says, 
God has shown you, oh, if you've not read the story, Pharaoh has a series of dreams um, about a time of lack and a time of plenty. And Joseph interprets to Pharaoh, this is what's going to happen. He says, your, your nation and the nations are going to go into a time of great famine. And so therefore, let's build up the stores. Oh no, sorry, great plenty of plenty first so that we can build the stores. And then in the time of famine, you will be ready to not only feed your own nation, but to feed the nations. Like that's what's going on in the story. But what Joseph says to Pharaoh is not just this is going to happen because this is just a random event on the earth. He says, God has shown you what he is about to do. It was God that was about to send the years of plenty and the years of lack. And then it was God giving a strategy if you would follow his command to resource the nations. Do you know what actually happened in those days of that famine? Have you heard of what happened in the climate? Apparently this is well documented because it was a global crisis. It was, it was absolutely global. So, I mean, we know this story takes place in Egypt, um, but what I've been told is that two unrelated climate disasters happened at the same time in this event. And so in the south and around Egypt and down the Nile, uh, there was extreme rain and flooding, which caused the river Nile to, to come up and cover all of the land. And so the, the land that previously would have grown crops and would have produced the food that fed the people, uh, actually it was just too wet to grow. And so year after year after year, they just weren't able to grow food. And yet at the same time, completely unrelated in a different, uh, I don't know what you call it, um, climate zone or whatever, in the north, around the land of Canaan and off the Mediterranean, they had extreme drought. They had no rain. So there was too much rain down here and there was too little rain up here. And where in the past there was good trade links between the north and the south, and so that if one was in a time of lack, they could trade from the people in the north or the people in the south. In these days, this freak incident happened in which there was a climate disaster unrelated in both and so it was a global famine in their days. They thought of that as like, this is basically the whole world in that both of these areas aren't producing food. And so we are literally that desperate. And God told them about it in advance. And God even said, it was, it's me that is gonna do that. But he gave them a plan and he gave them a strategy so that they would be resourced. And actually, we know that um, God brought about a great reconciliation in Joseph's family. I bet there was all sorts of other things that were, had national significance that aren't written about in that story. But I believe that there was very intentional reasons for that. Uh, I'll just give this up. There we go. So what, what am I saying there? I am saying that sometimes the climate disasters are an act of God. And if they are, he is giving us solutions to, to not only be resourced in it, but to point to his glory. Because maybe then people will have hearts that are humbled and that are desperate and that look up and say, oh, wow, there is a God. And he resources us and he helps us. I'm not going to say every climate disaster is that. I actually think that there is three, well, no, there's probably more than this, but I can think of, based on the Bible, three different reasons for climate disasters. One, I think sometimes we're just poor stewards and we do stupid stuff to the earth. I think that's just human will. It's the same as the human body. Sometimes we just don't look after ourselves and we get unwell because we have bad habits. I think it's the same with the earth. And that's where I actually love all the chat about renewable energy and uh, recycling and things, because I think that's just about us being good stewards of what God created. And then I think there's some natural disasters that are nothing to do with whether or not we sure did it well, but that, are, that God is intervening and God is doing something because he wants to bring people back to him. And then there is definitely a case in the Bible for the fact that sometimes there is a curse on the land as a result of sin. Sometimes it is a curse. And we can seek God for understanding and wisdom on how do we break that so that we can see healing. Can anyone think of a Bible time, Bible story, where there's a curse on the land that needs broken? so that it can be healed. They don't teach that in Sunday school, do they? They only teach the act of God ones. In Sunday school, they teach Noah and they teach Joseph. They, they teach all the climate disasters where it was God. I don't know why they say sometimes it wasn't God, it was just evil, right? So here's one for your Sunday schools. Second Samuel 21.1. You can write this down, you can read it later. I'm only gonna read you the, the opening bit. It says this. Second Samuel 21, 1 Samuel 21.1, during David's reign, there was a famine for three successive years. 
So David inquired of the Lord. What do we do in times of crisis? We inquire of the Lord. And the Lord answers, it is because of the blood shed by Saul and his family when he killed the Gibeonites. Now, the backstory to this story is, do you remember when the, God told his people, the Israelites, to not make any um, covenants, any agreements uh, with the other people groups? Do you remember that? And then do you remember when the Gibeonites came in and they made some agreements, they made some covenants together, which God had told them not to do? And then that, those agreements held in the spirit for generations. And then years later, Saul and his family, uh, they, they killed the Gibeonites. But because covenants had been made there, that act of killing the Gibeonites invoked a curse over the land that stopped the rain for three years. And so actually what God does then is he gives David a strategy for how to break that curse and how to have the land restored. And it's quite disturbing. You can read that in your own time. Maybe that's not why, um, that's why it's not taught in Sunday school. But the end of the story is the rains came, come back again and the land is fruitful. And so what I see there is King David looking at his nation saying, why is there a famine? Why has this been going on for three years? And then he seeks God. And in this case, God reveals to him, there's something that was nothing to do with you. It was everything to do with people in the past. But you can break this curse and the land can be restored. And so they do it. And then doesn't all glory go to God who is above all these things? Now, I wonder how many of the things that we are encountering today in our lives, are we so busy only thinking about how do we um, bring relief, which is great again, and I love that, that we're not even stepping back and saying, God, what happened here? Like, what happened here? Did we, did we get this wrong? Did someone else get this wrong? Is there something we can do to make this right and see healing so that people don't need to starve anymore? Or was this you and you want to draw people's attention to you and you actually have a strategy for how we can survive it? Like, guys, are we missing something? Are we missing something? I think we are. And I think this is something that we are not tapping into and to the extent that we could. And when Jesus says, do not be alarmed when there's earthquakes, when there's famines, it's because actually there's a lot of discussion here in the Bible about working with God in times of disaster, of having a relationship with him where we speak to him, we hear from him, we know how to walk out what he is doing on the earth and then we see him glorified and we see people come to him. Like that is what he is doing. And in the same way that I believe that the seriousness and the devastation of war brings greater opportunity for harvest, I believe that times of famine and, and climate change and, and these disturbing things that are happening in our earth, they are also opportunities that we can humble ourselves, we can pray, we can come back to God and then he truly will heal the land. Now, what a testimony would that be to the anxious and worried people who don't yet know God? The people who are riddled with anxiety and think there is no hope and yet we know the truth that there is hope in God, that he is very intentional in all these things and so we can actually offer a solution that goes beyond even what we can do practically. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, amazing. So, three things that you ask God when there's a climate disaster. Do you remember them? Is it you? God, was that you? Was that evil? Or was it something else? Because sometimes God does something slightly differently. I think it's always worth asking him, isn't it? Um, but yeah, the, the key is inquire of the Lord. And often he wants you to be a resource. Uh, one final thought on this. I find it interesting, and again, I'm not a climate scientist, but I find it interesting that scientists would say that the areas of the earth that are rapidly becoming uninhabitable, uh, uninhabitable due to extreme climate and rising temperatures also happen to be over an area of the earth that some Christians have described as the 1040 window. Has anyone heard of that? That is the area of the earth that is identified as having the most unreached people groups. And so isn't it kind of shocking and kind of alarming that in the areas that are really running out of time quickest and the people who are most vulnerable to displacement and death and end loss of life because their, their land is uninhabitable, those places contain the people who are most in need of hearing the gospel, who haven't heard it yet. And so I think there is an extreme urgency in these days 
to seek God, how do you want your truth to get out to these people? Um, and I'll tell you, I was actually in a prayer meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, with a, a number of actually Christian climate scientists and intercessors and, and people who are seeking God for what are you doing in these days, in these things. And, and I know there's a big gathering of nation leaders uh, called COP28 that's meeting in Dubai next week. And we were asking the Lord, Lord, what are you saying over this? Like, is there hope? Is there not hope? What are you doing? What are you not doing? And again, he just kept saying, keep your eyes on the harvest. Keep your eyes on the harvest. All of this chat around climate, it's got to bring people back to me because the heavens and the earth, they declare my glory. And when people are thinking about the earth and when people are looking at creation, I want them to see me and I want them to want me and I want them to come back to me. And so again, the statistics look very worrying in some of these areas where people haven't even heard the truth yet. People don't even yet have the, the gospel written in their own language. And I heard the Lord saying, in some ways, there is a death sentence already over these nations. And in some ways, it seems that it is too late for that sentence has gone out. But just as Hezekiah asked me to extend his life, if you pray, I will extend the time for these nations to hear my truth and to come back to me. But this will only happen if you pray and if you seek my face. And so I share that because this is not just about how we respond to God when our, our local area is in disaster, but actually, guys, there's an urgency on all being able to hear the truth of Jesus. And these things are very connected. And so we need to pray and we need to seek him and we need to inquire about what is our place in this. And again, it's similar prayers to war. We're decreeing a return to righteousness. We are decreeing the justice of God on all evil. We are decreeing that they will hear the truth. They will know the truth and the truth will set them free. That is what we're doing. Plague. Plague is another one. I'm not going to deep dive into plague. We all just lived through a plague, right? <laughs> we know what COVID was like. And I believe the Lord is saying, you learned lessons in COVID that are going to be useful for you to stand firm in future times of healthcare crisis. You will be able to stand firm if you hold on to the wisdom that you learned and you will lead many people to my glory if you keep your eyes on what is above and what I am doing and not in what is below and what is immediately in front of you. And that's what I feel the Lord wants to equip us with. Um, I've got a couple of things that I, I want to do here in ministry. So maybe I'll invite up the band. Is that okay? To get a bit, a bit of music behind this. Thanks, guys. That's brilliant. And so I want you to reflect right now. We probably all walked through different, different journeys, different things. What was the hardest bit for you? when we walked through a global, uh, national pandemic, when we went into lockdown. Just think this is reflection. What was the hardest bit for you? Mm, loneliness. Isolation. Not knowing what was going to happen when we, all the changing roadmaps, remember that? Concern and worry. Now I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, what weakness did that expose in me that you want to heal? Of the hardest things I suffered during the pandemic, what weakness does that expose in me that you want to strengthen and that you want to make me resilient to if I were to walk through that again or see someone else in that situation? Just think about that, ask the Lord. It's not an accident that you are on the earth in these days. You were created for such a time as this. Whether you are young or old, the experiences that you have walked through have set you up perfectly for this moment. I'm gonna say that again. The experiences that you have walked through have set you up perfectly for this moment. And we may be entering times of more unrest, of wars and rumors of wars, of nation against nation, of earthquakes, of disasters, of fevers and plagues and whatever you want to call them. 
And yet the Lord says, I cannot be shaken. You don't need to be shaken. And actually, I believe that the Lord wants to use his people to anchor those who do not yet know him and to point to the one true God so they can find hope and ultimately they can find salvation. And so I hear the Lord saying, arise army, arise army. You are the victorious ones. You are the overcomers in these days. Why don't you stand with me as, a, as an act of stepping up into the stand to your feet. And I'm gonna ask the Lord to show you because you have a part to play in the picture of what is about to unfold. You have a part to play. You are not someone on the sidelines. You have a part to play. You do not have every part and that's okay. But I'm sure there's something that I have mentioned tonight regarding war, famine and plague that has got you thinking. Perhaps it's something you've been thinking about already. Perhaps it's something new that the Lord is highlighting. And so in the name of Jesus, may you receive a spirit of wisdom and of revelation to understand what peace do you carry to the bigger picture of what's about to unfold? And I believe the Lord wants to pour out some encouragement right now to show you where you are strong for what is ahead. As we're doing that, I also heard the Lord saying that there's some people who are still suffering as a result of COVID. Maybe it is long-term um, effects of having had the disease. Maybe it's actually more mental health and the trauma of what you lived through. Uh, but I hear the Lord saying, I want to end that tonight. I want to lift that off of them and I want to set them free so that they don't look forward with fear and they don't look forward with trauma, but so that they stand strong and expectant in who I am. Um, so can I invite the ministry team down here just now? And I just, I just want to um, minister to those people. So um, anyone usually on the ministry team, if you come forward and I invite you, if you have long... Uh, long-term effects of what happened in COVID, whether that was physical or whether that was something else, please come on down and let these guys lay hands on you and lift that off you and command healing, command blessing. I, I'm just going to pray for them up here as well. You can grab onto um, what I say, but you guys, you just start ministering. You just start ministering where you are. And so in the name of Jesus, I bind every spirit of heaviness that has landed from that time. And I say, spirit of heaviness, you come up and off these people, you leave them alone. And instead I say, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You can do all things. There is nothing limited for you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. No height, no depth, no angels, no demons, no principalities, nothing can you separate you. Nothing will separate you from him. And in the name of Jesus, we lose healing in this space. We lose healing in fullness. And we say to anyone whose physical frame is still unwell or still fatigued or still slowed down or still uh, vulnerable in its immune system. I, I sense there's some people with compromised immune systems as well. And to those with compromised immune systems, I say be strong, be well, be made whole, be healed tonight. You will be well. You will be well. You will be well. This does not have to be your portion for your life. And Lord, though I praise you, though I praise you that you refine us in suffering, I declare that these ones will be well and these ones will testify to full restoration in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I see the Lord uh, depositing an increase in the gift of discernment, the, uh, the gift of distinguishing between spirits. And, and I sense that some of you really came alive in your spirit when I said, sometimes it's an act of God and sometimes it's a curse of evil. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you just now. 
but also when there's someone for you on the ministry team, just get them to agree with you for an increase of discernment in these days. And so Lord, to those that you are activating afresh, a new measure of that distinguishing of spirits, if that's you, just, you know, like, put in your hands in a receiving posture, grab onto it or something like that. But Lord, we loose an increase. We loose an increase from heaven of that understanding of what is good and what is evil. And Lord, I bless these ones to know instinctively, to know instinctively, to not doubt, but to know when is it you, Lord? And what are you doing? And when is it evil that we can lift off? When are there curses to be broken? And so we loose that fresh uh, activation of that gift and we call up the prophets we call up the intercessors we call up actually i sense there's people of influence who are not necessarily prophets but they act as prophets in their in their area in their field and i, and I believe there's many actually with the gift of that distinguishing of spirits and you maybe don't think you're a prophet in every other context but in your context you will know in your knower you will know in your gut you will say i believe that god was in this and actually if we respond to him if we humble ourselves, if we come back, then this will change. Or you'll say, actually, I think this is a this is a, a curse as a result of something that was nothing to do with us. But that we can seek God for the strategy of how to break it off. And I see the Lord actually bringing forward in the intercessor army, uh, people who previously preferred to stay in the sidelines and agree and say amen to other people's prayers. I see him bringing them to the front and saying, you're a new breed of intercessors. You are pure. You are not competitive and you hear me and I'm bringing you forward. I'm bringing you forward because your prayers are powerful. Your prayers are powerful. And I hear the Lord saying, don't doubt yourself. I gave you prayers to, prayers to pray. So decree, so decree. And I think that for some people in the room, we actually need to make a recommitment to rule and govern, govern with Jesus. You know, to not just uh, petition as, as children of the Father, though that is great, and please don't stop doing that. He's still your Father. But I think that there's a call to rededicate ourselves to say, Jesus, I'll work with you on this. If you tell me what to decree, I will decree. And so if that's you, I want you to just say these words out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, you are my king. You are my king. And I want to rule with you. So Lord, I give you my voice. And I say, open my ears to hear your words. And I commit to you, Jesus, that as you give me words, I will decree them. And I will speak them out in boldness. And so in the name of Jesus, I bless you to be filled with a spirit of boldness afresh. I bless you to be filled with a spirit of boldness so that you will know with confidence and I bind every spirit of doubt in here that sits on your shoulder and it, and it torments you and it limits your prayers. And I say, spirit of doubt, you leave now. You leave now, you leave now. And you don't even come back knocking. But I bless these ones to be confident in you, to be confident in what you are doing on the earth. And Lord, we say we don't want to miss out in these days. We want to see that harvest coming in fullness. We want to see people activated in you, in Jesus' name. And there's a new anointing in, I see in the room to preach the gospel. And it's a new preaching the gospel. It's not like the old preaching the gospel. It's a new preaching the gospel. And I hear the Lord saying, it comes with ease, but it's so relevant to the times and the seasons because there is a new openness in non-believers now that was not there previous. And so there are words to say and there are ways to preach the gospel that are perfect for the time at hand. And I believe that there's actually some of you who are frustrated about the lack of breakthrough that you're seeing in unsaved people around you. Um, if you are frustrated, by the lack of breakthrough, can you also get the, the ministry team to lay hands on you for a new boldness in preaching the gospel, but also just to agree with you, to agree with you for the breakthrough in those people. Because I believe we're on the edge of it and the enemy wants to say it's stuck, but I hear the Lord saying, it's not stuck. 
It's not stuck. It looks stuck. It's not stuck. So if you're seeing the stuck places, or seemingly stuck places, come forward, get someone to agree with you. I'm going to pray that right now, though, and those of you who are not coming forward, you pray this with me. Lord, you are the Lord of the harvest. You are the Lord of the harvest. And I praise you for testimonies I've even heard this week of people come to you. I praise you, Jesus, for how you are revealing yourself to people, for how you're showing them the truth. I know you're doing that. And so, Lord, we say now that every stuck place comes unstuck. We say, may there be a new boldness to preach the gospel. May these seeds of truth be sown and be received. And we say to the land, may the land receive it. May the land receive it. May there be soft land that receives these, these seeds. In a way, they will be planted. And we bind every weapon formed against the preaching of the gospel in this place. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we say nothing comes against the preaching of the gospel in this name. But there will be fiery, bold, fearless people who preach the gospel in the most unlikely of places. I think we need to contend for this corporately. If you pray uh, in the spirit, if you pray in tongues, um, I would encourage you to to pray along with me out loud. I think we need to lean in for this a bit. If you don't pray in a heavenly language, pray in your own language, that is good too. Uh, You can pray things like, praise you Lord, Jesus, you are good, or just use your words to pray this. But I think we need to push something here uh, to see a release of uh, the gospel again and and that fresh feeling of how to preach it. Let's pray together.
Lord is saying as well that there's some people who are involved in really caring for the vulnerable uh, and really bringing relief to, the, to the, the afflicted. And actually, I hear the Lord saying there is mass scale harvest coming to the most vulnerable in, in society. And I think we need to almost like lay hands on the people who work directly with those people and bless them into what is to come. Anyone in the room in that kind of work? Yeah, yeah, can you guys just gather down the front? And I feel like we just need a couple of people Maybe it's in the ministry team or just whoever's around. Can we lay hands and bless them into the fullness of what is about to come? Because I think there is there, there's mass scale salvation in the vulnerable, and the most vulnerable in our society are going to become the leaders of the next round of the broken in. And I think we need to bless the workers into what is about to come. So if you're at the back of the rooms, be praying for this. Be praying for this and agreeing. And um, if you're at the front, um, let's make sure that you're all being blessed. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you are doing and what you are about to do. Thank you, Jesus. saying 
but there's some someone or some people, I don't know if they're in the room or if they're online, uh, but there's someone who has not been walking with Jesus and is thinking, oh no, I don't think I'm in right standing with God right now. And I don't know what this means when we're talking about what is ahead. And I hear the Lord saying, just come back. Just come back. It's not too late. It's not too late. Just come back to me. And I hear the Lord saying, you're trying to make sense of your suffering and you're trying to make sense of what has not come together and what fell to bits, what fell to the ground and where you were betrayed and where you were disappointed. You're trying too hard to make sense of these things. But I tell you, child, I'm here. And I hear the Lord saying, just come back to me. Choose to do it my way. And when you go again, I will help you. I will give you keys of wisdom. I am the light to your path. I will lead you forward. And you can trust that as you come back to me and as you do this a second time, it will be very different the second time than it was the first time. And so if that's you, I encourage you, even right now, don't go home like before you pray this. Uh, pray something along these lines. I'll give you a prayer, but you can say it in your own words. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry I've just not been with you in this. And I ask for your forgiveness. And today I say I want to commit my way to you again. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me because I can't do it in my own strength. You can pray your own words in that. And Lord, lead me on the path to life. Lead me on the path to life. And I see the Lord removing uh, guilt and condemnation, not just on those people who prayed that prayer, but actually I think that guilt and condemnation have been like clouds over a number of people who maybe even know fine well that that's what it is, but yet it still can't shift. And I hear the Lord saying, just blow it off. <laughs> just blow it off. It's just a cloud. It's vapor. <laughs> so we say guilt and condemnation. You come off. <laughs> you come off these people right now. And we say there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Say that to your neighbor. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Say it again to the other neighbor with conviction. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And Jesus, we thank you that you are a good master who we can trust. We thank you that you lead us, you equip us, you empower us. Holy Spirit, you activate gifts in us. And so, Lord, I decree that these are the fearless ones. I decree that these are the fearless ones, fearless ones whose confidence is in you, Jesus, the King. Because, Jesus, you are the King. You are the King. And we praise you. Thank you, Jesus. We 